Now that we've analyzed our first simple circuit, I'd like to try a little bit of a more complicated example. So this is example circuit number two. In this case, instead of having just one resistor, we're going to have two resistors. Using our uh, symbolic diagrams then, what I will do is I will draw my circuit here. I'll have a battery, right, with its plus and minus terminals with an EMF curly E. Then I will connect a wire to that battery and it will go through the first resistor, which I will label as R1. It has a resistance R1. And then that resistor will actually be connected now to a second resistor, which I shall call R2. And that then will complete my circuit. So the question then that we are going to want to determine is how much current I, again, is flowing through this first resistor. I think we can see immediately though, 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 that because at this junction, whatever current flows into that junction has to be flowing back out of that junction, it's clear that whatever comes out of resistor R1 goes into resistor R2. So we're actually solving for the current through both of these resistors or each one individually. So that's the question that we're trying to solve. If we're going to go ahead and analyze this, once again, the analysis for any circuit comes down to Kirchhoff's two laws. If we uh, begin with Kirchhoff 1, uh, which is the current law, what we find here in this case is that, as I have just indicated, the current flowing through the two resistors is the same. And in fact, if I think about uh, labeling my junctions, I might call this junction here A at the bottom of the battery. This would be B. Here is C. Our intermediate point then would be D and our final bottom point then would be E. If we look at the current then flowing out of resistor R2, it's clear that it enters E. So then what flows then out of E across the lower element again must be the current I. And you can see then that this same current I is flowing all the way around this fairly simple loop. So in this case, the conclusions are pretty simple from K1. It's just that all the currents are the same. And in fact, we know what they equal. They have the same value that we're trying to solve for I. K2 now, Kirchhoff's second law, this now is going to give us some more detailed information that might not be immediately obvious. Once again, using this law, it says, well, if I will can get zero, if I go around any closed loop, Again, that's because, well, if I go from point A to point A, clearly I've done nothing if I just take the simple loop from A to A. But what I'd rather do than that and just get that simple zero is to take a full loop around, some, uh, around the circuit. So then I conclude that zero also then is going to be equal to, in this case, the voltage as I go from point A to point B go from A to B, and then the voltage from B to C, and so forth as I go all the way around my circuit. After a while, it gets tiresome to write out all of these terms. Now, let's see what's going to happen next. If I go through this very carefully, then zero will equal. And now we're just going to go around our circuit. Now you can go around your circuit to actually in any order that uh, might please you. In this case, I think it might be interesting actually to go around the loop in this opposite direction, just for a little bit of practice with the signs. So what I like to do in these uh, circuit cases is I like to draw kind of a little pathway here. I'll draw this inside my circuit, right? That shows me the direction around which I'm traversing the circuit. And also, I, what I'd like to do when I do this is I'd like to mark my starting point with an X. This helps me make sure that I don't go too far. The classic mistakes in this analysis are either not to get completely around your loop or to actually go a little too far and add in an extra term going around your loop. But an uh, expert tip that I have is that if we always mark our starting point, we can be sure then to stop. So I'm going to go around in this direction starting at point A. 
So here I start with my x. I'm going to be going along this wire here. So that's going to be plus or minus the current times, in this case, it's an ideal wire. So it has no resistance. So I multiply by 0 in this case. The sign now, though, is interesting. Notice I'm moving this way around my loop, but the current is flowing in the opposite direction. So I am now going upstream. And whenever we go upstream, we go up in potential. The voltage is positive. So in this case, we would choose the positive choice. Of course, it's zero, so it doesn't matter in the end. But it's, it's good to be very careful with these things. Next, we're going to go from E up to D. Now, we're going across the resistor R2, which has a current I flowing through it. So the change in uh, the, I mean, the voltage then is either plus or minus I times, in this case, R2. Once again, we are now going um, upstream. We are fighting the current. One way on these diagrams that is very useful, and I highly recommend to keep track of these things, is that whenever you label a current passing through a resistor, you think immediately about which is the upstream or downstream side of your resistor. If the current is going down in this direction that we're assuming, then the upside of the resistor would be the plus, and the downstream side of the resistor I will label with a minus. Similarly, for resistor R1, because the current that we're presuming the positive current is, would be flowing downward, then the, this would be the plus side of that resistor, and this would be the minus side of that resistor. One little sidebar that's very important to keep in mind, which uh, students and, and myself actually, the first time I began learning this, begin to fi uh, find confusing, is, well, how do we know the current's actually flowing in this direction? For this circuit, we can kind of guess because we know the positive charges on the top of the battery really want to be driven around the circuit down to the negative terminal. They hate being stuck together on the top side. A more complicated circuit you might not know. But it all comes down to a matter of sign conventions. If we assume that I is positive, we can always just treat it as though it were. If we happen to have made a mistake, when we solve our equation, we'll just get a negative number for I. If I comes out positive, we know it's flowing in, in our, our direction. If I comes out negative, it just means the flow is in the opposite direction. It's just like when you assume you know, the velocity is along the plus x direction when you analyze a mechanics problem. You can do that as long as you're consistent with your signs. And if you happen to have guessed wrong, that's OK. Your velocity will just come out negative. Well, the way we maintain consistency with our signs here is by labeling the plus and minus sides of our resistors always consistently with our presumed flow of current. So let's proceed then. Right. So far, we managed to go up uh, stream up this resistor as we follow our path. We're then going to hit the next resistor, R1. That will give us another plus or minus I times R1. But in both cases, it turns out we are going from the minus side of the resistor to the plus side. That means we're going from lower potential to higher potential. So we would be as associating this with a positive voltage. So we have to assume or we presume the positive sign for these two terms. Finally, we have the final wire. So that will again be a plus or minus I times 0. But in this case, we know it's the plus choice. And now, finally, we're going to traverse the battery and get back to our stopping point x. Now we know we're done once we include the battery. For the battery, notice, we are going from the plus side of the battery down to the minus side. That's the opposite way from uh, how the uh, conventional terminal choices are on the battery. We're going from plus to minus. That means when we include the voltage change due to the battery, we had better choose the minus sign in this particular case. So now that we've uh, accounted for all of our signs and all of our terms and done all of the physics, the next step always is to simplify this as much as possible. We have two terms here which give us 0. If I rearrange things a little bit, I find that uh, 0 equals, and I have two terms here now which both have a factor of i. So let me factor out that i. 
and then what I is multiplying turns out to be an R1 and an R2 by the distributive property. Let me write those in, in in normal order, R1 plus R2. And then finally, we have minus the EMF, minus curly E. This now is an equation that we can solve quite readily, as we have in the past. In fact, it looks a lot like the uh, a single resistor equation. Just now, we have the sum of the two resistances. So we just move E to the other side of the equation by adding it, so it will come with a plus sign over here. And then to solve for I, we just divide by the factor R1 plus R2. So our final answer then is I gives us the EMF divided by R1 plus R2. And that's the answer then for our second circuit.